Well, good evening, Wake Chapel Church family and friends, and welcome to Holy Week Tuesday. Welcome to another time in the Word where we will honor God by spending time in His Word. His Word speaks to us in so many ways. It encourages us. It lifts us. It instructs us. It tells us what He's speaking to us personally. It corrects us. So whatever God wants to say to us through His Word, we receive it. As always, I am super excited to be here with you tonight, and I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that you are greeting one another in the chat. Good evening, Wake Chapel Church. If you all are greeting one another, make sure you be on the lookout for visitors who are visiting with us virtually. And I want to say welcome to you who may be visiting with us in our Bible study, which is being held virtually. But I'm glad we're doing it this way because then you're able to be here with us. So God bless you and thank you for joining and tuning in. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Before I get into anything else that I want to say tonight, I would love to just take this moment. I want to just take this moment to remember and to pray for the city of Baltimore and those families that have been impacted and the government officials and the first responders and everybody who's on the front lines to um prayerfully rescue some people. We know that it is, um, you know, an ongoing investigation, and I'm sure it will be days, weeks, even months before they have all the answers. But let's keep that governor, let's keep the mayor, let's keep all the people who have to make decisions, the people who were on the boat, who were responsible. The list goes on and on, and most certainly the families that are now being impacted personally by this terrible, horrific, tragic event. So we're praying for our brothers and sisters in Baltimore, those pastors, those churches that are right there on the front line. We're in another state, but they're right there. And so certainly they're going to have to minister to people right in their city. So we're praying for those pastors and those and those servants of the Lord who will be um, ministering to people in their city. Let's not forget that. Well, we'll move on and do what we need to do tonight. I want to take a moment before I start the Bible teaching and remind you to stay connected to us. Always stay connected. There's so much happening here at Wake Chapel Church. We're excited about this Holy Week. We have been walking to the cross for two days, uh, Monday and Tuesday with our prayer calls, our, our devotions rather in the morning. Tomorrow morning, we have our final uh, Walk to the Cross prayer call and devotion. So we're going to ask you to make sure you're tuning in for that. And then Thursday night, we'll be gathering in person at our Bland Road location for our Maundy Thursday uh, Remembrance Service, where we will continue our Walk to the Cross. And our elders will be speaking from eight themes of things that Jesus said on his way to the cross, not what he said after he got on the cross, but on his way there. In fact, I'm actually going to give you an overview of that tonight, and then they will dig in deeper on Thursday. So I'm inviting you to come out and be part of that with us. And then on Good Friday, you can just come into the sanctuary anytime between 11 a.m. and 4 and just have your own personal time of devotion and fellowship with God as you remember the cross. And at 12 noon or 3 p.m., you're welcome to stay and join other disciples in a time of communion. So make sure that you're staying connected to us so that you have all these details. You don't have to write it down if you just if you're connected. We're sending you text messages and emails and the information's on our website and it's uh it's everywhere. It's on our social sites. So if you're connected, then you don't have to worry. You will have real-time information. And of course, finally, the big celebration, the ultimate celebration, which is Resurrection Sunday. 6 a.m. we will meet for a sunrise service, and then at 9 a.m. we will culminate with our um, Resurrection Sunday, the familiar term to the world, Easter Sunday service, where we will come together and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. All right, I wanted to tell you that. Make sure you are aware of everything that's happening. Lastly, thank you for your giving. Thank you for how you continue to support this ministry, how you take care of your church, Wake Chapel Church disciples. Thank you for taking care of your church, for believing 
in your church where you are being fed, where you get to serve, where you have fellowship and community, where we are able to reach out our arms to to surrounding areas. Thank you for remembering that your tithing and offering is needed in the house of God to do the work of ministry. And and God knows Wake Chapel Church is a faithful body. And those of you who are uh, not part of our body, but you continue to, to share in the giving, we appreciate you also. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now, let me just give you this in advance. This is totally some sort of weird allergy season here in Raleigh. The pollen falls like snow. And I am uh, just like many of you. We are human beings and this body reacts to all kinds of things. So I've got my tea here tonight. Um, I, I, you know, when you start taking um, sinus medicines and all of that, it leaves you a little lethargic or whatever. But we here in Jesus name. All right. But if I need to take a sip or if I need to clear my throat, I'm apologizing in advance. But we're going to get through this together. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we glorify you. I thank you for my brother, my sister who's tuning in tonight, who is standing in need of a word from you. May your word speak. May it speak loud and clear. And may it say everything to us that our hearts are in need of in this moment. But mainly, may it remind us of this tremendous week of of remembrance where we uh, celebrate and commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord. This is the gospel. This is what we believe, and this is why we're here. So may your word illuminate that experience for us again, and may we be reminded of the faithful God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, If you were with us on Sunday, we were tremendously blessed. My God, if you weren't with us or if you didn't tune in, please go back and watch the replay. We were tremendously blessed with the ministry of um, Reverend Fatima Saleh. Boy, did she bless us. And so um, I'm not continuing anything from Sunday because I wasn't the speaker Sunday, (laughs) but she was amazing. If you haven't had a chance to see it, please go back and watch it tonight. I'm going to continue with our theme for this week as a church. Our theme is a walk to the cross where we walk the entire week culminating with Jesus coming to that cross and then rising from the dead. But we, we, we just relive and go through daily what, what was happening and what was going on. So Thursday, our, our elders are going to be speaking from several themes and I'm just going to um, introduce them tonight. And sort of we'll we'll treat it more like a devotional. We won't dig in too deep, but we will borrow and extract a few lessons from what we see here in the text. So if you're taking notes and if you want to write these verses down and then you'll be really ready on Thursday, you can go through with this with me together. I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 26. All right. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26 and we're going to uh, look at verses 17 through 19. Matthew 26 verses 17 through 19. This is a walk to the cross. What were some of the things that were on Jesus's heart and on his mind as he was preparing to go to Calvary? What were the last things that he was addressing among his community and with his disciples? What were those most important things that he wanted to say? before he left. Uh, Before I get into what he said, may I share this with you? And some of you have heard me share this before, but for you who have not heard it before, I think this will minister to you. Profoundly, Jesus shared his final thoughts as he prepared to exit planet earth. When my mother was transitioning, those of you who've not heard this before, I was privileged. What a privilege. She watched me take my first breath And I was there to see her take her last breath. Just a beautiful exchange. I was privileged to be literally standing there with her when she took her last breath. I witnessed it. But before she took her last breath, she had been in a coma for seven days. She had not awakened. And just before, I mean, I would say minutes, probably maybe five or ten minutes before she expired, she woke up. And um, the, to the nurse and everybody's surprised because, you know, they had called us together to, to say, you know, this is it. This is that imminent moment that has arrived. And so there we were. I had been with her, you know, all those days and had just let you know how it goes. You leave to go take a shower and change your clothes. And these are the things that happen. So I had just, you know, rushed back in. And as I was coming in, her eyes popped open. And the nurse said, I've never seen anything like this before. Her eyes pop open. 
And she begins to try to mouth something to me. Her mouth is just like this, but nothing's coming out, obviously. Um, and she's, she's doing this repeatedly. Like she was really trying to say something to me. And I started saying things to her instead because there was no way I could know what she was trying to say to me. So I started saying things to her like, um, you did a good job, you know, raising me. I turned out okay. Um, I'm going to be okay. I won't stop preaching the gospel. I mean, I just started saying the things to her that I knew would, would mean something to her for me to say. And in that moment, she she took her last breath. And I, I vowed that day when I left there to be the kind of person to make sure that I would say everything I wanted to say while I could say it. So for anybody that I wanted to know that I love them, I want to tell them that. For anybody that I need to get something off my chest with, I'm going to tell them that. For um, any message that I feel God has called me to share with the world, I'm sharing it. You know, that I don't want to, I, I thought in that moment, I don't want my last moments to be struggling to say something that I can't say. And so back to this text, I'm, I'm just moved by the idea that Jesus, you know, really took the time in his final week to say everything that he wanted recorded and everything that he wanted left behind. It was all captured. And so these are very powerful and important moments as he's approaching the cross, because these words to me are significant in that I can't leave without getting these last points across. So I want to encourage you as we take these lessons from Jesus Christ, that we also take ownership of our words and that we see how important it is to say what needs to be said at the appropriate times, under the appropriate circumstances, and for the reasons that bring life and health and help and healing. And may our words not be destructive and may, that, may they not be a cause for other people's um, emotional demise or the, the cause of contention, but may our words be words that are spoken and fitly in season and may we learn from our Savior the value of saying what needs to be said at the appropriate times. So here in Matthew chapter 26, Verse 17 through 19, and I'll just come in at verse uh, 18, really. This is the moment that he is having, well, let's just read it. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to him saying, where do you want us to prepare you to eat the Passover? So the, all the debates about Jewish Jesus' Jewish heritage, he was on his way to eat Passover supper. So we know that he was a Jew, okay? And he said, go into a city, uh, to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them and he prepared and they prepared the Passover. Um, but what's the important phrase that he said here? He said, my time is at hand. And again, I'm not going to dig deep into these points because our, our elders are going to do that. They're going to do this profoundly on Thursday. So you don't want to miss it. All right. But he, he says, my time is at hand. He makes an announcement that this is wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. And, 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 and this, what, what, what quick lesson do I want you to get here? You know, being, being sensitive to your own personal transitions, being sensitive to your own movement when, when one thing is ending and something else is to begin, um, when it's time to move on, when it's time to make a change, when you are, you need, we need to be aware spiritually of our own transitions and what is God saying to us and our families and certain seasons of our lives. You know, I like to hold on to stuff and I like to hold on to people. I like to hold on to things that are comfortable, that feel good, that I'm familiar with. I'm the creature of comfort. I want familiarity, right? And so uh, a lot of changing, I'm like, Lord, do we have to? But we must be sensitive to the necessary changes. Jesus was about to now transition from his earthly posture and return to his heavenly glory. And as much as he probably loved walking with his disciples and being there for them and teaching them and walking with them and all those that he touched, he knew that his time was at hand. So I want you to just ask the Lord during this Holy Week to keep you sensitive to the areas of your life where you need to be saying, my time is at hand. There's, a, there's an evident, imminent change here. There's something that needs to happen here. 
that will that will exit me out of one place in my life and I will enter into a new space. My time is at hand. And these are lessons for us, all right? These are lessons for us, all right? And then we go on and we stay in Matthew chapter 20. What's the second thing that he said? In Matthew chapter 26, we stay there. We, we pick it up at verse 20. He says this, when evening had come, he sat down with the 12. Now, as they were eating, he said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrow. And each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in this dish will betray me. The son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not even been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. You know, what a what a moment. I, I, you know, let's just be practical here for a moment. You know, and I know, nobody feels comfortable with anybody around them that they can't trust. (laughs) You know, you want the people that you're eating with, that you're doing business with, that you're working with, that that are part of your family or your inner circle. You want these people to be the people that you can trust with your life. These are the folks you want to be able to say, no matter what, I know this person here loves me and they have my back. I don't have to worry about them. So just imagine the grace that it takes for Jesus to be at the table with his betrayer, having a meal. What what a marvelous grace that is demonstrated by him in that moment. You know, we have a we would want in our day in our lives to 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 push everybody, get them out of here. You know, we that's all if you want that type of teaching and 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 help. And I don't mean literal teaching. I just mean people with their ideas and opinions. You just head to social media. They're going to tell you how to cut people off. They're, they're going to tell you how to do that. But only Jesus can show you how to keep close to you, even those who are not for you. Oof. Wow. Only Jesus can demonstrate that. How you just keep them close and you let things play out. You know, sometimes people just want to just just start stabbing at things and people and stabbing and stabbing and cutting and repositioning. But no, that is not, that is not. What does he say to him? One of you will betray me. He makes it clear to all of them that somebody in here ain't right. <laughs> and, but he doesn't say who it is. He doesn't say anything. And they all ask the same question. Lord, is it I, is it I, is it I? According to what Matthew has recorded for us, They all began to ask the same question, but it was when Judas asked the same question that everyone else had asked. What does he say to them? He says, you have said it. You don't have to worry about trying to discern what's in somebody else's heart. They know what's in their heart and God knows what's in their heart. You know, and I was young and didn't understand a lot of things. I wanted to try to get ahead of stuff and, you know, try to stop things and people and this and that. And, but I've now learned that God sees far deeper than I can see. He knows what I don't know, and he doesn't need me to butt in. (laughs) Because what was happening, what did Jesus say? This is necessary. This has to happen. So sometimes God allows people, circumstances in our lives that inflict pain, that cause discomfort, but it is pushing us forward. It is taking us to where God intends for us to be. Jesus didn't spend any time wrestling with Judas. He stayed on his purpose and he continued on. All right. So what is our lesson here? One of you will. Somebody around us, somebody in our lives. I don't preach the hater words. I try not to too much. Every now and then I'll get a little bit of that in, but that's not my thing. Because because the very people that are yelling and jumping and screaming about haters, sometimes they are the hater. <laughs> so it's like a circular fight to try to determine who in the room who the hater is. But what I do know is this. If something is coming against you, just as Jesus with grace and dignity sat right there in the midst of it and didn't make that an issue, he stayed focused on his walk to the cross. I encourage you to do the same, that you stay focused on what God is calling you to. All right, let's continue in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 30. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to the, to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he broke it and gave the 
gave the cup and gave thanks and gave it to all and gave it to them saying, drink it, drink from it. I'm reading fast. So I was trying not to read every word. So skip, forgive me for sort of skipping through it. Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the new vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out the Mount of Olives. When I was growing up um, in our churches and in communion, um, the way we took communion at our church, and I remember it so clearly as a child, um, communion, first of all, was always a separate service, and it was always on Sunday night. And it included feet washing, and it was just a whole thing. So the men were always escorted out to one place. The women stayed in another place. The women were in white. You know, those who were going to be washing feet, everybody's in white. And the communion table <clears throat> at the church where I grew up, was on, they would set it up on the pulpit in like our fellowship hall. So not the main sanctuary. We had a, a, another downstairs hall and they would set the communion table up there. And um, at, as groups of 12 or so, I, I was I was young, so I'm, I'm, I don't know the exact number, but I'm assuming around that. Literally, they would take turns going to the table. And 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 they and after they would take communion at the table, um, they'd sing a hymn. They'd sing something, and as the groups rotated, they sang. They take communion and they sang. And I'm talking about just beautiful. I just, I just some of those memories will stay with me forever. I know the world has changed and people has changed, and nobody wants anybody washing their feet and all that kind of stuff is going on now. But that stuff created fellowship and love and things that I will never forget. And so when I read this text, I, I get that same sense of community and family and love that they're together having this meal and then they sing a song together and then they depart. But what is the whole point that he's introducing here? He says, this is this is my new covenant. He says, I'm introducing for this is the blood of the new covenant. He is introducing them very gently to what is to come that the old covenant had sustained them. And now the new covenant is where they're about to go, where the, the temple will be torn, the temple curtain will be torn and they will now have access to God in a brand new way. I, I, we just need to be reminded that we are under a new covenant. And we also need to be reminded of the beauty of this moment. May God restore. Here's one of my prayers. I am so sick and tired. I'm just tired to, the, to my core of people who come to the house of God, serve in the house of God, and just can't, just refuse to get along, just refuse to have koinonia, just refuse to have brotherly love, affection one for another. The people's hearts are hardened. And 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 it and it and it burdens me and it bothers me. Um so I just want us all to ask God to help us to really come under this new covenant. And step into this moment here where they were in koinonia and fellowship together, having the Passover meal and being prepared to do so much more work together. And they were going to, it had to start here. So there is a new covenant and Jesus wanted to make it clear because remember, we're walking with him to the cross, right? So after he exposes that there's going to be a betrayer, he goes on to take communion and have fellowship with that betrayer. And then he, he introduces this concept this is the new covenant. This meal that we're having, you're, you're seeing it as a Passover meal, but I'm showing you that this is the first communion and this will introduce what is happening to me. All right. I want to move a little quicker than I'm moving. I'm just having so much fun with this word. I just love the word because I really feel like I'm walking to the cross with him. And I'm so happy that these things are recorded for us in scripture. Let's just move a little faster though. So, uh, cause I've got a few more to go. So John chapter 14, verses one through four, he says something so beautiful. I won't read it all, but I'll just give you the first line. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. On his way to the cross, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled by my departure, by what you're about to see, by what's about to happen. And I want to say that to you today as we take this walk to the cross. Let not your heart be troubled by the things you see and hear and feel. And, you know, the bridge collapse in... In Baltimore, at this point, they're saying they don't see any, uh, they don't attach it to terrorism of any kind. That's not what they see. 
But I was so reminded as I stood there and watched the loop over and over. And you probably saw, you've seen it by now over and over all day, right? With it showing you the loop, the moment where the bridge just crumbles. It's like paper. It just crumbled like paper. And while I was standing there, I was so reminded of Jesus's words when he looked out over Jerusalem and he said, there will be a day when not one stone will be left. There will be a day when all these things that we have built, that man has built these beautiful buildings, these bridges, these highways, all the things that man has built. That do you know that there will be a day when we will watch many of these things collapse, whether it be by human error, accidents do happen, whether it be by the hands of terrorists, whether it be by the the, the hands of um, you know people who who just are evil. We don't know, but because. We, we live in this fallen world. We must anticipate that there will be things around us. But what did Jesus say to them here? Don't let your heart be troubled. So today I say to you, do not let your heart be troubled. My morning devotional verse today, I just needed it desperately. I didn't even know how much I needed it until I read it. And I, and I just was like, Lord, I thank you for how you speak, even in our quiet times. It says this, though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. That's Psalm 91 verse 7. And that was just happened to be my devotion today. And I'm just like, Lord, thank you. <laughs> because so much does go on around us. And sometimes you, you, your heart can get troubled. But Jesus says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Let's keep it moving. John 15, it's a lot here in John 15. We're not going to read all of it, but I'll say this to you. He, he says, I chose you out of the world. This is when he's talking to them about if the world hates you, you know that it hated me. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So he was preparing them, letting them know I have extracted you. You are different. You are mine. You are God's holy people under a new covenant. God's holy people initially was just Israel. God's holy people, the church, will be made up of many nations and tongues and people and tribes from around the world. I saw a clip yesterday on Instagram of a, a church in India, thousands of people singing praises to our God, a country where that's, uh, that is not a Christian nation right? But there are Christians there. And so I'm just watching. The, the, this is the new covenant. The new covenant is not just Jewish people. It is the church. And so he says, I have chose you out of the world. Be reminded that you are chosen. Every time I shop for fruit, I'm reminded of how Jesus has chosen me. <laughs> I went to get some apples yesterday. Pick up one and put it down. Pick up another one and put it down. Say, no, this is the one I want. That's how Jesus chooses us. He, we don't know why he's... Listen, I'm not getting into that with you. <laughs> Why he choose me? You can spend time asking that question. I'm going to spend my time saying, thank you for choosing me. <laughs> thank you for choosing me. I have no idea why, because ain't nothing I can see in my life that, 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 that makes it why it should even be so. Especially when you're someone who hasn't been chosen by people. That's a whole nother story. I'm not going to get into that with you right now. But that's a whole, that's a whole teaching by itself. But I can tell you, I'm one of those people. I've not been chosen by people. I've not been chosen to be part of the in crowds. I'm not chosen on the A-list. I'm not on anybody's A-list. I'm not called to all of that stuff. I'm not that person. I'm not chosen in that way. But you know what? I'm chosen by God. And what do I mean by that even? I just mean chosen to be loved by him, just chosen to know him, just chosen as one of the people who knows who he is. And so we've got to make sure that we understand that when he says this to him, he says, I've chosen you out of the world. I have taken the time to pick you out of the out of the litter and out of the bunch. And for this, we should be thankful. Do you see the things that were on his heart, the things that were important to him? He told that he wanted them to know that his time was at hand. He wanted to be make it clear that he understood by the hands of a betrayer, this is how it would have to play out. He knew who it was. He made it clear that this time of fellowship that we're having is to introduce a new covenant. And then he comforts them with these sweet words, do not let your heart be troubled. And he tells them, I've chosen you out of this world. And then as he gets a little bit closer to the cross in John chapter 16, he begins to say, the hour is coming. Y'all are going to all take off and leave me. And I know it <laughs> because people can't handle the heat sometimes. It is true. People love you when things are going good. Hey, listen, I'm not trying to make my life the testimony tonight, but I have so many testimonies. Sometimes I throw them in there. But I've lived two distinct seasons in my life. Two distinct seasons, actually three. <laughs> 
where when it looked a certain way for me, oh man, this everybody wants to be around. And then when it wasn't, I was by myself. Trust me, they scattered. <laughs> and so when Jesus was doing the miracles and, you know, 5,000 people plus men and children were eating for free and blinded eyes were opening and it was, it was a big deal to walk next to him because I'm walking with the guy that everybody else wants to walk with. And then now to say, oh no, that's him. Kill him. Yeah, that's crucial. Then he says, you're going to scatter. You're going to take off and run. That's going to happen. But his grace brought them back together again. Whew, that's a whole nother sermon. I'm not preaching. So we're not going to go there. But thank God that everything that scatters, the hand of the Lord can put it back together. Those same people that were a body, eventually they came back together. And those are the people that ended up in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. And because of their waiting time, we are here. Because they waited to hear what needed to, to, to see the manifestation of what had been promised. And then they left that room and went and started preaching the gospel. And that's why we are able to be here right now. The reason, the only reason we know about it is because those same people who scattered themselves, Jesus brought them back together. All right. Um, in John chapter 17, Jesus prays for his disciples, including all of us, that we would never be plucked from his hand, that we would never be lost, that we would be eternally be his. And his prayers have endured centuries. We are in his hand. We are in the hand of the Lord. I was visiting one of our dear disciples on Sunday and uh, some some illnesses. She's battling some illness. And I said to her, I don't have all the answers for you, but here's one thing I can assure you of. You are in the hand of the Lord. Because Jesus prayed that we would never be plucked out of his hand. And so no enemy in hell can pluck us out. We can jump out. <laughs> We can get in our flesh and go our own way, or we can just stay put and let him, let his prayers over us be that. So finally, and I'll close with this, the most, the moment that we commemorate so and hold so dear to our hearts is when he prays this prayer in the garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 39, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. May we all take that posture with all the things that we're praying for and asking for and looking for and hoping for and wishing we could change. May we conclude every prayer with this, these words, not as I will, but yours be done. That is the last place we see him in this very profound moment before he's whisked away and heading towards the cross. Let's walk this week and continue to commemorate this glorious week. Let us read these passages. Let them sink into our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Let's hold them dear to our hearts and, and ask God to Teach us every lesson. I'm so excited to hear from our elders on Thursday, to hear what God has downloaded into their spirits, to, to usher us even closer to that moment where we commemorate the cross and learn every lesson that God has intended for us to learn. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just holding it dear. So I pray for you, and I pray that you find um, strength in this week, that you are encouraged in your faith, that you are lifted, that you are prepared to do more and greater things for the kingdom, that as the world collapses around us, that we be reminded that we are forever in his hand and he's not going to let us go. Amen? Amen. Wow. I enjoyed this word myself. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we glorify you and we honor you so much. I thank you for everybody that's under the sound of my voice right now. Whether they're watching it right now when we're airing it or when they're watching it in the replay, whenever, Lord, you know what they stand in need of. You know how this word has found them and where it found them tonight. And may it push us forward. That's what I keep hearing in my spirit. Lord, may your word push us forward. May it push us forward in you. May it push us forward in the plan and in the cause. We need you like never before. We don't have time to get caught up in the foolishness of life and the cares of life and the foolishness of unmanaged emotions of our hearts and the things that we allow to lie in our hearts is terrible. God help us to be delivered from that and to walk in purity and in righteousness and in truth. May we be truth tellers. May we be truthful people 
May we understand why you died on the cross to set us free from everything that holds us captive in our minds and in our bodies and our wills. We are not to be captive to anything, but you have called us to a life of freedom in Christ Jesus. And so I thank you now that every person who's tuning in, who's listening, that you are doing a profound work in their hearts, that you're doing a new thing in their spirits, and that you're taking them to higher heights and deeper depths in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. I am praying for you, and I want you to pray for me. Pray my strength in the Lord. That's not just a sentence. That's a real thing. Pray my strength in the Lord. The warfare gets tough. We handle it, but that doesn't mean we don't feel it. All right? So we feel it. You feel it. I feel it. This, it gets it gets tricky, but we have a word. These evils will not touch you. It might be going on all around us, but uh, we're held dear in the hand of the Lord. Make sure you tune in tomorrow morning and be part of uh, this continuation as we walk to the cross and make sure you join us on Thursday in person. If you don't have a church home, if you are not a Christian, if you haven't given your heart to the Lord, if you've never said yes, please reach out to us. Our doors, our hearts are open. We are ready to walk with you as you discover your own walk in the Lord Jesus Christ. So please reach out to us and we want to get that going and we want to be there to walk with you every step of the way. God is adding to our ministry. He's adding to our church and he's also adding souls to the church, not just transfer growth, but actual, he's also adding souls. And that's what we're after. We're asking God to help us to evangelize, to join in with these other churches in this city. Please hear me, hear my heart. I'm praying for the pastors and my, my peer pastors. Lord, bless us all to touch our city. May our city be taken over and may our churches be seen as seen as cells of safety and not churches where people are well, let's see what they're doing and we're doing. No, we are all part of the body of Christ. So I'm asking you that if Wake Chapel feels right for you and, and God is calling you to this house, come on in here because we don't want to leave you out there by yourself. But more than anything else, we want you in the kingdom. So go somewhere is what I'm saying to you. <laughs> go somewhere if this ain't the house for you. But make sure you are attached to the kingdom of God and that you're serving somewhere and somebody is walking with you in your walk as you discover your faith and go deeper in Christ Jesus. All right. What else was I supposed to say? Oh, don't forget, if you haven't given tonight, go ahead and take a moment and uh, give to the house of God if we if you didn't get to do it. And if you can't do it tonight, bring it with you when you come to church on Sunday. You got two chances to come, 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. I love you with the love of the Lord. This word has me wrecked. This week has me wrecked. I'm just falling in love with Jesus over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over. That's the song over and over again. Sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Sweeter is the love between my savior and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I pray you're doing the same. Many things are going on in this world, but guess what? You can rise above it. Keep the faith.